Well, I thank you for blowing in with us today. The, hair, the, the wind was so bad, I, I hope that I look okay to you. My, I couldn't do a thing with my hair. <laughs> Thanks for helping me out with that, Barb. So, we had an election, and I think, uh, I think I'm going to hold off to say anything till we know the true count. The only thing I want to say to you is that I want to encourage you, whether you agree with who is in power or not, may I encourage you to pray for our nation's leaders? May I encourage you just to pray for them? Lift them up. So one thing I've done last week and I'm going to do this week is I, I'm just going to read you some texts that I'm getting from some of you that tell about how God's using you in the lives of your neighbors and coworkers and family members. These are so fun to hear. So this one came from a grandmother, and this is what she says. She says, the same week that it snowed, I went to Walmart to get some ice melt. When I got into the store, it was on display at the, at the front, and as I was looking at it, a young man came up to me and we struck up a conversation, and the next thing I know, he's asking me if I can help him. He needed to ask advice. He was supposed to pick up some feminine products for his girlfriend, but was not sure what he was doing. Have you ever been there, guys? It's like when she tells you to go pick up a bra for her, you know, I mean, we just feel clueless. I went over and helped him. We talked while waiting in the checkout. He asked if he could help me carry my stuff to the car. When we got there, he put two bags of ice melt in my trunk, and I asked him what he was doing. He said, it was to repay me for helping him. So all this lady did was help a guy in the store. Jail, are you hearing this low, low wind hum? It's, uh, it's up here, I don't know if you're hearing it. Another one is, um, my neighbor was sick for over two years with Lyme disease and could not continue her job. I told her I would continue to pray for her and she welcomed prayers. Now, are you catching this? This lady has a neighbor with Lyme disease and, and she didn't preach to her. She just said, I will pray for you. We were in contact by text. I asked her how she was doing and if she needed anything. I would cook on occasion and leave some food on her doorstep or give it to her husband. Her husband had to do the cooking and house cleaning because she could not get up out of bed or on her couch. This year, God moved in her health and she is healed. She is now working from home and has her old job back. I praise God for all that he's doing. Now that's neighboring, folks. Is that not great? God actually healed this woman of Lyme disease. That's just so powerful. I love it. Keep sending those texts, guys. I love hearing about how God's using you in the lives of those around you. Well, today's message is entitled, A Conduit for the Power and Love of God. Have you ever seen yourself as a wire? a conduit for the power of God, for the love of God. Now, we've been going through the good, the, the good Samaritan story, excuse me, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, enjoying talking about how Jesus is saying there is a kingdom here, and if you'd like to be a part of it, you could be a kingdom citizen, and this is how. In chapter 5, he basically spelled out that you can't get there by yourself. You have to have grace. And grace is the only thing that will empower anybody to be a part of the kingdom. Then he gets to chapter 6, and he begins to talk about the habits, the disciplines of people who are a part of his kingdom. He talked about three faith builders, giving, praying, and fasting. I wonder if these are a part of your life yet. Are you making it a regular part of your life to give, to fast, to pray? Now, I'd just like to challenge you on the prayer part during this part of our message because we're going over, this, we're basically going over the Lord's Prayer. 
And I, I just want to ask you this. Will you consider making it a daily priority to push in to Jesus? And I, what I mean is not just while you're driving in the car, but would you make it a priority to get alone with him and to, and to spend some face-to-face -face time? Hey, have you ever noticed that when you date somebody, it's fun to be at a, at a crowd with them, be at a party with them, you, you, you experience them in a crowd? It's fun to hang out with them while you're driving, but there's nothing better than looking at them in the eye and having a profound conversation. And I have learned that God's, God's got all of the love languages, all right? One of those is quality time. He just loves quality time with us. So may I challenge you that if you don't have quality time with him, that you'd make that your priority? Now, let's just read through the Lord's Prayer, shall we? I'd like you to read it with me. And the reason we're doing this is because I'd like you to memorize this if it's not already memorized. And I'd like you to teach your children. If you have children or grandchildren, let me invite you to teach it to them and reward them. Man, if they can say it, then uh, do what I do and take them to ice cream, okay? All right, let's start. Ready? Everybody read it together with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, the thing we know for sure is that Jesus gave us this prayer as an outline. And it's not meant to tell us how long to pray. You don't, you don't have to feel a law about how long you have to pray. All I want to encourage you is to pray until what George Mueller said. George Mueller said, someone asked him, how long do you pray? And he said, I pray until my soul is happy. I think that's good. So last week we talked about our Father in heaven. And Jesus showed us that the Father in heaven is a dad. He introduced God as a dad. That's profound. And then we talked about hallowing his name, entering his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. And we talked about how worshiping the Lord at the beginning of our prayer turns on the Wi-Fi and enables me to have a very broad band in communication with him, both me to him and him to me. Now, this is what he says now. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I don't know if you're catching this, but Jesus is telling us to invite his kingdom to come. And the invitation is for it to come through me. Like when I'm, when I'm praying this prayer, I'm saying, will you use me to bring your kingdom to those around me? Your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life today. This is a great prayer because I've just worshiped him and now I have just said to, myself, said to him, I'm inviting you to use me today as a conduit. Bless others through me. Let your kingdom come and your will be done through me. I was praying this yesterday, and the Holy Spirit brought to mind a young lady that used to that I met uh, up at uh, up at a navigators camp a few years ago, and I've been noticing that she's just in a lot of pain in her Facebook posts. She doesn't say that she's in pain, but it just comes out of her. And so I've just begun to pray for her. I, I told my wife I was praying for her. She said, Randy, that's silly. Why are you praying for some college girl that you met up there? She didn't even go to our church. I said, I don't know. But I'm just inviting the Lord to touch her right where she is. And that's what I heard, so I'm just going to obey it. 
So this is the second part of prayer. I've just magnified and glorified God, and now I'm going to take time, are you ready for this, to listen Have you ever had a conversation where it felt like the person you were talking to wasn't listening to you? Some of you weren't listening. Let me just say that again. Have, have you ever had a conversation where you wonder if the person you're talking to is not listening? It, it's, it's really unempowering. It makes you feel like you're not important. Here's the thing that, that God wants us to understand about prayer, is that it is a conversation. I think most people think that it's a monologue. I want to help you understand something. God is always talking. He's always communicating. The question is, am I willing to listen? So he has something to say, and right now I'm saying, Lord, I want to invite your kingdom to come through my world. I want your will to be done in me. Like, I, I want what you want. Like, when you, folk, when you think of heaven, do, do you think of conflict? Do you think of people battling about who should win the presidential race? Do you think about people being lonely? Do you think about people being unhealthy? No, you see, what, what we're praying is for what God does in heaven to be brought on earth through me. Through me. That's what he delights in. He loves father-son, father-daughter projects. He loves working through us. He, he just gets a kick out of it. He just thinks it's the best thing ever. So the other day, I'm teaching my three-year-old daughter how to color in the lines, because usually she picks a, a, a coloring page and just goes. And I said, let's try something really fun. You want to try this? See if you can just use red inside these lines right here. And, and she did it. Now I said, try green just within these lines. And then she threw, threw the crayon down and said, did it! Well, who was more pleased, her or me? Both of us. Because I got to get my will, which was, my will was to color in the lines. And my will was to teach her how to be observant about how God causes colors to stay inside the lines. And so she got it. It's so fun. That is just such a fun thing for a father and child, grandchild, to do things together. Now, as we talk about taking a time alone with Jesus, I think that you can do it any time of the day. You really can. But what I'd like to invite you to do, because of this line right here in the prayer, is to have a time with Jesus in the morning. Can I just encourage you to think about that? You say, I'm not a morning person. Friends, I want you to know that I was not a morning person when I went to college. And the Holy Spirit began challenging me to get up early in the morning to pray. And it took years for me to find myself awake enough to enjoy prayer. But I was bound and determined to make it happen. Now, why do I say this? Because when I meet with Jesus in the morning, one of the greatest things is I can commit this day to him, and it sets my mind on thinking about how can I bring the kingdom of God into this day? And I'm committing the day to him. It's his. So I'm just saying, Lord, use me today. 
Then when I pray at night, when I'm laying in bed, I'll say, how did I do today, Lord? Did I miss you at all? And we kind of evaluate the day. But if I pray in the morning, I'm just committing to him that I'd like to make this day a day where I am looking for what he's doing. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this, but when God guides us, he doesn't give us a map. Have you ever noticed that? Wouldn't that be great if he could just, like if you could say, Lord, what's, what's your will for my life? Well, you see, you're gonna get a job at this company for three or four years. You're gonna get frustrated with your manager, so you're gonna quit and you're gonna go to work here. And then you're gonna, you're gonna do really well and you're gonna get three promotions. And you, you never get that from God. You know what you get? The next step. It, you never get a real clear picture of everything that's going to happen. You say, what about, what about Joseph in the Old Testament? He knew that he was going to be ruling over his brothers and sisters. Do you think he would have really been excited about that? If he would have known that he was first going to be almost killed by his brothers that he was going to be sold into slavery by his brothers, that he was going to be accused of adultery when he didn't do anything and thrown into prison for several years? Do you think that he would have been excited about that? But God didn't tell him any of that. He just gave him the end picture. So the idea here is this. God asks us to walk hand in hand with him and let him lead us step to step. And it's scary, especially if you're a person that doesn't like surprises. How many of you really would prefer not to have surprises? Raise your hand. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, there's quite a few of us. See, surprises aren't that much fun to us. Um, guess what? Um, God is a planner. I, I know that makes you feel really better, doesn't it? If you just raise, he's a planner. But let me add this. He also loves surprises. And he'll challenge you to be open to do something that is scary. So, may I translate your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Let me translate it into modern English. Ready? What are you doing today, Lord? What are you doing? What are you doing in my life? And second, may I join you? Can I get in on what you're doing? So that's all I'm doing. And you don't have to say your kingdom come, your will be done. All you have to do is say, Lord, what are you doing today? Now, here's the truth. He may tell you right then what he's doing, or he may tell you during the day. It, you never know for sure when he's going to tell you. But you listen. Many times he will give you a thought. He'll give you a picture of a person. Like yesterday, I got the picture of this young lady that I met up at, at uh, YMCA of the Rockies. So, friends, it, you may hear about it now, and you may hear about it later on in the day. I remember when I was in seminary, I was given two choices. I could go, this was two years after seminary, I was still a youth pastor, and, and uh, I had a chance to be a pastor in Crested Butte, Colorado. This is where I yearned to be. I wanted to be back in Colorado. I'd spent 10 years in Texas, and I was ready to get home to Colorado. Oh God, would you send me to Crested Butte? One of the parts of my job was to preach on the slopes on Sunday, and if I would do that, they would give a yearly ski lift ticket to all of my family. Now, for me, 
This was the pinnacle of success. The second choice was to change denominations, to go to a, de to a denominational church that I didn't, I, I didn't like the denomination, I'm just being honest, in Indiana. And I was, I was I, what I yearned for was to be a lead pastor, and I wanted to be in Colorado. The job in Indiana was with a different denomination. It was to be a college and missions pastor. And I was to serve in, the, in a town that I'd never even heard of. Now, folks, which one would you choose? And I just said, Lord, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? What, what are you doing? And I remember I was also a teacher in our Christian school I was, I was at, and I was teaching the kids on the book of Acts, and, and I'm writing stuff on the board. This is, the Lord hadn't told me whether I was going to Crested Butte or to Indiana, and I'm writing something on the board, and the Lord says to me, hey, would you like to, uh, to pastor people who are um, all wealthy and will here, be here today but will be gone tomorrow? How's that sound to you? I said, I, I'm not too thrilled about that because I really would like to invest my life into a group of people. Or would you like to invest in the life of young people who are voraciously hungry for me and to plant churches in a country where they have no idea who I am? So he was inviting me to get in on what he was doing. And immediately I went, oh boy, I'm going to Muncie, Indiana. I'm going, I'm going to Muncie. I went home. I said, honey, sweetheart, I think God's telling me that we're going to go to Indiana. She said, you're kidding. She wanted to go to Colorado too. We had to work through that one for a little bit. Not really. She was just open to whatever God was doing. But when I explained to her what he said to me, she said, oh boy, we're going to Muncie. Muncie. You know what they call Muncie? Funcy, because it's just the opposite of fun, see? It, and I was there for 12 years. But boy, was it good. We planted churches in Central Asia. I got to invest in the lives of young people who are still friends today, who I still stay in contact with, who their lives were transformed. My life was transformed. So this prayer sets me into watching to see what God is doing all day long. That's all I'm doing. I, I'm just looking, and I'm just being aware of what he's doing. Lord, let your kingdom come through me, and if I can be a part of it, I'd be glad. Listen to this passage from Jesus in John chapter 5. So Jesus said to him, truly, truly, whenever Jesus says truly, truly, he's talking about my granddaughter, truly. No, he's really saying, I'm very serious here. I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord. What, what can Jesus do? Th this is the king of the universe. Jesus, the king of the universe, is saying, I can't do anything on my own initiative but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. So if Jesus himself could do nothing apart from what he saw the Father doing, who are we to think that we can do anything for God apart from him? So Jesus just said, Father, what are you doing? Every day. What are you doing? Almost everybody, including people who have never been to church, have heard the Good Samaritan story. Did you know that the Good Samaritan story is a story of a guy that was just on his way traveling somewhere and saw what God was doing and got in on it. 
Did you notice that? Like he just saw a guy who had been beat up and robbed by thieves, and he said, Lord, are you, what are you doing? He, he didn't even have to ask. God, it's obvious that you want me to have compassion on this person. You see, this is, this is how simple it is for you to learn what God's doing during the day. Somebody at work will say to you, man, I'm really hurting today. And what you can say is, may I pray for you? And, and you don't have to be weird. You don't even have to lay hands on them because I've, I've laid hands on people that didn't know Jesus and they thought it was weird. So just say, may I pray for you right now? And just lift up a simple little prayer for them. Most people, I'd say 99% of them don't mind a bit if you pray for them. In fact, they love it. But the good Samaritan saw a Jew. Now, these are social enemies. We frankly don't have anyone in our culture that is an enemy like, like the Samaritans and the Jews. You say, you mean between different races? I don't think it's even close to what this was. This was a deep-seated hatred. But this Samaritan looked past that and said, God, this guy needs compassion. He needs help. Now, what's interesting in this picture is you look way, way back there, and there's a couple of guys that missed out on God, what, what, what God was doing. They were religious people. Jesus tells the story as it being a Levite and a priest, which basically means a pastor or a minister. <laughs> it means the same thing. And they saw what God was doing and didn't see what God was doing. They just walked across on the other side of the road. They had so many religious things going on in their mind that they couldn't see what God was doing. The man probably appeared dead. And in their religion, if you, especially as a priest, touched someone dead, you would be unclean for a certain amount of days and you wouldn't be allowed to go to church, their synagogue. So they were probably worried about that. Oh, I can't touch him because that, that would be bad. Because, see, they're focused on being good people rather than being loving people. Are you with me? So they completely missed what God was doing. So Jesus, you can tell, would just daily ask the Father what he was doing. I don't know if you've ever read John chapter 5, but there was a pool at Bethesda, which was basically a hospital. There were all these sick people. And Jesus walked into that hospital and healed one guy. He healed one guy. Because that was what the Father was doing. Jesus and his disciples were walking along, and all of a sudden, a leper came up to him and bowed before him. Now, lepers were supposed to stay a, a certain amount of yardage away from you, and this guy already broke all the rules because he came that close to Jesus. And he apparently heard the Father say, touch him and tell him that he's cleansed. Jesus was willing to do crazy stuff. No one in their culture would touch a leper. But Jesus knew one thing. God plus me is the majority. God plus me is greater than anything leprosy can do to me. God plus me is greater than COVID. Just let that sink in for a minute. God plus me. When I get in on what he's doing, there is power released. There is love released. Do you hear that beginning letter? That lady was praying for her neighbor and love and power released. And this neighbor sick with Lyme disease, so sick she couldn't even get off the bed, she was healed. Think about it, guys. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem one day, and a blind guy wants him to heal, doesn't even, 
doesn't even know him. Jesus looks at him and his disciples say, gosh, they, they have a theological question. Did he sin or did his parents sin? They're not even looking at what God's doing. They're thinking theologically. And you know what Jesus does? He does what the Father's doing. Catch this. This is hilarious. He goes, and he makes mud out of his spit and dirt. And then he puts it on the guy's eyes. <laughs> Here you go. Put a, little, put a little mud on your eyes. Now I want you to walk over to the pool of Siloam, which was a half a mile walk. And he's blind. Does that feel compassionate to you? Just, just go on over to the pool of Siloam, and if you'll wash there, you'll see. And the guy had faith. He said, okay. And he found his way over to the pool of Siloam, washed the spit off of his eyes, and he could see. Now, that's graduate school level. Like, I, I'm not encouraging anyone here to go out and spit in the mud and put it on somebody's eyes tomorrow unless the Holy Spirit really makes it clear. But guys, that, he could lead you to that point. But preschool level is seeing people who need compassion and helping them. And then when you get to the point of being able to touch lepers, to put spit on the eyes of the blind, that's after you've been walking with him for a while. Because he does weird things. He does stuff that you're not used to him doing. Are you up for it? I'm telling you, like, you, friend, if you're a Presbyterian by nature, you start doing this and you will be a Pentecostal before long. You'll be doing cartwheels for Jesus, you're so thrilled. And may, now, if you're still Presbyterian by personality, you may be doing those cartwheels inside that's okay. But I just want you to understand, when you start doing what God's doing, there is no greater joy on planet Earth. So here's a few questions that I'd like you to just incorporate into your prayer, okay? And, and they're just prayers that invite what God's doing into your life. So number one is, how am I trying to identify myself apart from you? You see, I want your kingdom to come in me and through me, and it can't happen if I'm trying to identify myself by how much I own, by what I wear, if I'm trying to identify myself by my job, if I'm trying to identify myself by my, by whatever. And I, I just wanna be identified as your child. Will you help me with that? Question number two. These are fun. Not. Who is irritating me? Why? Do I see myself in them and not know it? A while ago, I was leading the college group, and there's a young man that just was always just as loud as he could be. And, and I said to the Lord quietly, I said, boy, he sure is loud. And the Lord said, so are you. <laughs> oh, boy. You see, many times if people are irritating you, that's a sign that God wants you to do something compassionate, gracious, and gentle and forgiving. He's working. Like, did you know that God is working through brother or sister sandpaper who's rubbing you the wrong way? That is God's way of saying, oh, here's an opportunity for you to let my kingdom come and my will be done through you to them. If I'm a woman, how can I show my husband unmerited respect today? I get this from Ephesians 5, verse 22 and following. 
women have a very difficult job in marriage because God challenges them to give respect to their husbands and the woman always demands that the man earn her respect because in every other relationship, respect is always earned. But you see, a man is transformed by a woman giving him unmerited respect. So, so you're just asking the Lord, how can I respect him today? How can I honor him? How can I make him feel like he's the greatest guy in the world? You say to yourself, he doesn't deserve it. Of course he doesn't. You know, I wish Apostle Paul would have said, wives, submit to your husbands as soon as he's perfect. No, what that means is I'm going to find ways to respect my man even when he's imperfect. And it, it will be transforming. The Apostle Peter, in chapter 3 of 1 Peter, says that a woman can change her husband without a word by her attitude. Simply by her attitude of unmerited respect. That's a big one. Okay, guys, yours is even worse. Are you ready? If I'm a man, how can I show my wife unconditional love today? That means I have to die to myself, and I need to listen to her. I need to just let her blow steam off. The other day, Gay was upset about something. We both came home. And I know that I, I've been married almost 35 years, and I finally have figured something out. When she's just going on and on and on and on about how frustrated she is, she wants me to listen. I, I know, it took a long time. And so, so I just, I, 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 I just I, at the time I was watching a football game, I turned it off. And, and I, just, I just thought, wow, she is really wound up. And she just had to wind and wind and wind and wind. Just, just, you know, we're both external processors. So she just was processing externally. And I was just going, uh-huh, uh-huh. She's back at the back, back there just looking at me. And just going, <laughs> I love you. And she just was winding. And you know what happened? I just loved her. And it was God's way of telling me, this is how I'm ministering to your wife today. And, and it helped her. I, it took me a long time to figure out how to do that. But how is God telling you to unselfishly love her today? You may be driving home and he'll say, buy her her favorite candy on your way home for no reason whatsoever. Do this for her. If I'm a son or a daughter, how can I show honor to my parents today? Like, how, Lord, I just want you to use me. How can I honor them? I, I let, when I was a, teen, uh, a, a youth pastor, I would tell the kids this. You guys want to freak your parents out? Take out the trash without being asked, and then just sit back and watch how they freak out. Who took out the trash? What's going on? I did. I didn't even ask you. I know. I love you. You're whoa! Ah! I said, it's the most fun way to freak out your parents you'll ever find. Clean up your room without being asked. It's, it's an inborn thing on teenagers that you do not lift a finger unless you are asked. And you learn to do this. If I'm an employee, I ask the Lord this, how can I work for you today, not for my boss? How can I work for you with an attitude for you, not for my boss? This is how his kingdom comes through me in very simple ways. 
Ask this question, who do I need to lavish grace upon today? Who needs grace? I'm willing to lavish it on them, but you, you show me. As I'm going through the day, do, and, and I just need to lavish grace on someone, you show me. You show me who it is. Finally, I'm available to love someone who needs your love today. You just nudge me when you want me to do that. I'm available. Just want to let you know. I'm available. If you want to love someone through me, I'm available. Let your kingdom come through me, and your will be done through me today. So all I'm asking is that you nudge me. Sometimes I'm a little dense about this, Lord, so just nudge me, and I'll do it. Those are some practical ways of asking God to let his kingdom come through you. May I ask you to close your eyes with me? Let's just try a little bit of, of uh, stuff right now. Um, who, who here has someone in your life who is really suffering and is uh, either ill or is depressed or is miserable? Anybody? Okay. Let's ask him, Father, how would you like to use me in this person's life today? Today. Now, he may be giving you a picture right now. He may not tell you right now. You may get the idea later on. But Father, I give you permission to speak to me about how to love this person today. Now, with your eyes still closed, how many of you would raise your hand and say, I have people in my life, especially one person who just really irritates me. Would you raise your hand? Great. All over the place. Lord, how do you want to use me to lavish grace upon that person today? How, how do you want me to lavish grace, which is unmerited favor? Of course they didn't merit it. They're irritating me. And so I ask that you would show me how I can love that person today. Finally, let me ask you this. How many of you are going to be going outside of your home, maybe to a restaurant or to a, to a grocery store today? Would you raise your hand? Would you just join me in praying this? Father, would you, as I'm journeying, just like the Good Samaritan, would you show me how to have compassion on people who need it? Would you use me as an agent of heaven? Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.